Welcome to another episode of Thinking Like a Bank, where we show you how to think like a bank by applying the same strategies and principles that banks use to help you find more financial freedom in your life. I'm your host, Sarah Ibrahim. Thanks for checking out this episode, where I talk about the reasons why I became a CFP professional. To start, what is the CFP designation? It stands for Certified Financial Planner, and it's issued by the CFP Board. The CFP Board was founded in 1985, and the mission is to benefit the public by granting the CFP certification and upholding it as the recognized standard of excellence for competent and ethical personal financial planning. The, C- the CFP certification also shows others how committed you are to the industry. Consider the turnover rate in the financial services industry. It's important for clients to know you're committed to them and to the industry. I was first introduced to the CFP certification in 2014 when I was first introduced to the financial services industry. I met with a hiring manager at a firm I was interested in. The hiring manager explained how ongoing education was a big part of this role, and he mentioned the top designation in the industry is a CFP certification. I ended up working at a different firm, but I kept the CFP certification goals in the back of my mind. I knew I would attempt this goal one day because it sounded interesting and important, and it being a difficult certification really piqued my interest. What really made me want to take the leap was after I became a bank on yourself professional. In order to become a bank on yourself professional, I had to go through training, which included financial planning, insurance, and taxes. So I knew I wanted to deepen my knowledge on these matters by pursuing the CFP certification so that I could pass this value on to clients with helping them with their financial plans. I also looked at it like a martial art, where you start with the white belt and then you move your way up. I think all industries are like this. There's always room for advancement, especially when it comes to education, specifically self-education, which differs, of course, from traditional education. Self-education is where you are learning simply for yourself and really at your own pace. You're not necessarily going to a traditional school. You don't see professors every day. You don't have assignments due every week. Whereas traditional education is where you have a formal educational setting. When it comes to entrepreneurship, I would argue that self-education is far more important than traditional education, although I still believe in the importance of traditional education. The CFP coursework is broken down into seven courses and a board exam. The first course includes general financial principles, which has material like the psychology of working with clients, preparing clients for college funding, economics, and how inflation impacts financial planning. The second course includes insurance, which dives into almost every type of insurance, including auto, home, business, life, disability, Medicare, and long-term care insurance. The course talks about deductibles, co-pays, limitations, and exclusions, and important details for CFP professionals to address to their clients. The third course is investment planning, which had topics like projecting returns for clients in the stock market, risk levels of stocks, how bond durations are calculated, and how certain investments are more liquid and why this matters for clients. The fourth course is tax planning and was probably my favorite. The course explained the different tax buckets like active income, passive income, and portfolio income and how to apply losses and gains to each bucket. Also how to net long-term capital gains and not long-term capital losses, how to calculate a personal income tax return, how marginal tax brackets work, and how the alternative minimum tax system works. The fifth course includes retirement planning, which is obviously very important in financial planning. This is usually the most talked about section of a person's financial plan. This course went through all of the different types of retirement plans, including defined benefit plans and defined contribution plans, also plans for self-employed clients. The sixth course includes estate planning, like what happens to all of your assets when you pass away? What if you have a will? What if you don't have a will? Do you pay any tax on the assets you leave your beneficiaries and other items related to estate planning? The seventh course is the final project. Unlike courses one through six, there is no final exam for this course. Rather, you're given a set of questions and you have to answer these questions in an essay format and provide reasons for your answers. The purpose of the seventh course is to demonstrate your ability to present clear and understandable solutions to clients. Keep in mind that the course requirements don't apply to everyone. For example, if you're an attorney, chartered financial analyst, CPA, or hold a PhD, then you can skip all of these courses and take the exam. 
Check with the CFP.net to learn more about that. The final exam includes 170 questions divided into two sections, 85 questions each. You have three hours to complete each section. In 2023, the CFP board announced that 64% of applicants passed this, the exam. This is mainly due to the topics included. Like imagine you have a question about homeowners insurance and the next question about the standard deviation of a stock. The next question about how much of a client's self-employment income will be subject to social security income tax. As you can see, there's a lot of information. Aside from the educational requirements, there's also a lot, there's, there's a couple other requirements like you need a bachelor's degree and a certain amount of hours completed in the industry. Now, if you're wondering, was it worth it? The answer is absolutely yes. The CFP certification overall was worth it. Over the last two years, I learned a lot of new creative things that I'm sharing with clients, like how you can avoid the 20% automatic withholding tax from 401ks, how you can use business losses to mitigate taxes, how to gift five times the annual gift tax exemption limit, how to completely avoid gift and estate taxes, how to make sure your disability insurance policy will pay a reasonable amount compared to your income in the event you become disabled while also maintaining affordable premiums, how to choose a low cost, low risk index fund, how to apply certain tax credits to lower your overall tax bill, like the lifetime learning credit, how to choose a retirement plan as a sole entrepreneur, how to make your estate assets private in the event you pass away. Aside from all of the financial tax, insurance, retirement, and estate planning, the CFP training reminded me of an important lesson I learned while completing my MBA. It's process over results. I was once in a finance course and one of my professors was telling us a story about how he was a financial analyst. He mentioned his role was completing five-year projections for his company. After two years, his company required a new five-year projection and the cycle continued. I then asked him why he completed a five-year projection if, you're, if he's going to change it every two years. And he responded, simple, it's process over result. The process of identifying key factors in the financial analysis helps the company learn more about the economy, its competition, and the overall market. I, get, I can definitely apply the same logic to CFP training. The process of learning about financial strategies has helped me become a better learner, listener, and teacher, especially with clients. So now it's been six months since I've passed the CFP exam, and my business is still the same. I still help clients with the bank on yourself strategy, primarily consisting of high cash value whole life insurance to build cash and to use alongside investments. What has changed the most now is I have to wear a hat that says fiduciary, not literally, of course, but I do have a new bar I have to meet with clients. I now need to make sure that the solutions I help clients with are not only suitable for them, but also in their best interest. To be transparent, I was already doing this prior to becoming a CFP professional. It's just now become more official and a requirement per CFP board requirements. So you may be asking, how do I make sure the solutions I help clients with are in their best interests? One way is through the financial analysis meeting with clients. During this meeting, clients and I block at least one hour to go through their entire financial picture. We go through their retirement plans, insurance, real estate portfolio, brokerage account, and all of their other goals and concerns. We then meet again to go over the strategies and solutions which are aimed at their goals and concerns. We then include the pros and cons of applying those strategies we provide versus other strategies clients can apply. For example, applying funds towards a dividend paying whole life insurance policy over the next seven years versus increasing the amount they add to their brokerage account consisting of mutual funds. In this example, the client understands the difference, with the differences, the pros and cons of each, and the client has the information they need to make an informed decision. The key factors we'll look at in this case, rate of return, tax implications, level of risk, and liquidity. If you're in the financial services industry or you're an accountant or a lawyer and you're thinking about pursuing the CFP certification to better understand personal financial planning, here's how you can become a CFP professional. First, check on the CFP board's website to see if you need to take all seven courses or if you can bypass the courses to go straight to the board exam. Again, you may, be, you may be able to do this if you're an attorney, CPA, PhD, or CFA. Now, assuming you do have to take all seven courses, then make sure to choose a reputable program. I went with Kaplan's College for Financial Planning. Their professors were very knowledgeable and helpful. Their textbooks made sense. The videos were very helpful as well. Also, they have a complete self-study program, which means you can complete the course entirely on your own. You have 90 days to complete the course from the time you're enrolled. 
after completing the courses, you'll then need to sign up for a 10 week study program to prepare you for the rigorous exam. I also went with Kaplan's College for Financial Planning program. They have a 10 week program and I committed three hours per day, every day consistently. On the days I took the mock exam, I blocked six and a half hours, three hours for part one, a 30 minute break, and then three hours for part two. I took two mock exams before taking the actual exam. Now, when it comes to the actual exam, here are some helpful tips. Number one, block out a consistent study schedule. For example, every day from 9 a.m. a.m. to 12 o'clock p.m. It doesn't have to be this exact way, but you want to have a similar time every day so your brain gets used to studying at a certain time. Also, you want to have a clear start date and a clear, a clear start time and a clear end time. So that way you're motivated every day. I've seen some students study until they get tired. I don't like that method really because it's, a, it's an unpredictable method. Tip number two, while reading the textbooks and videos and watching the videos, hand write your notes. This helps you remember the material. Tip number three, teach what you are learning. Teaching helps you retain more information and helps you better understand it. Tip number four, take as many practice questions as possible. Tip number five, write your own flashcards. Some of the college programs out there will send you pre-written flashcards, but I prefer you hand write your own questions on your own flashcards. When you ask questions about something, you get a better understanding of the subject. For example, imagine if I handed you a book and I asked you to read the book and then provide me with 10 questions rather than 10 statements. By finding 10 questions, your brain will search for more information to formulate the questions, especially asking open-ended questions. Now that I've completed the CFP exam, it's been very mentally relaxing, but I actually miss the intellectual journey. I've enrolled in a program to become an enrolled agent, which is a license issued by the IRS. Enrolled agents can provide tax advice, can help clients prepare their taxes, and can represent clients in an audit. Although I'm on track to becoming an enrolled agent, I don't plan on preparing taxes for clients or representing clients in audits simply because that's not my focus. I plan on becoming an enrolled agent to enhance my financial literacy and tax knowledge. I also plan on giving clients limited tax advice, primarily related to retirement planning, as this would be more aligned with my current business and skills. Thanks for listening. I hope you got a ton of value out of this episode by learning about the CFP certification. Please reach out to me directly if you have any questions about becoming a CFP professional or if you're looking for a new perspective to your financial situation. You can go to thinkinglikeabank.com. Also, if we're connected on LinkedIn, feel free to message me. Thank you and see you next time on Thinking Like a Bank. To learn more about what we do and how we can help you grow more wealth, please visit www.finassetprotection.com. That's F-I-N, assetprotection.com. The topics presented in this podcast are for general information only and not for the purposes of providing legal, accounting, or investment advice. On such matters, please consult a professional who knows your specific situation.